One of the most important things any framework should have is an optimized and easily accessible way for client-server communication. Obviously, in Roblox, the way we make this happen is with remote events or remote functions, but in this video, I'm going to talk about some stuff that I had been doing wrong up until recently, and I'll also give you a couple of tips on how to improve your remotes or remote systems. And no, this is not gonna be a fraud video like the one I made a year ago. We don't talk about that. By the way, I would recommend you to watch my previous video on frameworks. You don't have to watch it to understand this, but if you want to do this step by step with me, you'll need some sort of module loader. And if you don't know what a module loader is, well, that's your sign to go watch the video. What are you waiting for? Anyways, pay attention because just like my previous upload, this is going to be somewhat of a heavy topic. So heavy that it's going to be most likely divided into two different parts. But with all this being said, let's start the video now. Alright, so let's break this down from the top. When it comes to communication between scripts, there are four instances that pop up. You got remote events, remote functions, bindable events, and bindable functions. And immediately, we kind of start seeing a pattern here. We got remotes, meaning remote events and remote functions, and we got bindable, so bindable events and bindable functions. Remotes are used to communicate from client to server or vice versa, and bindables are meant to be used to communicate client to client or server to server. And the difference between events and functions is that with one of them, you can return data. But we already know this. I wouldn't have said this was going to be somewhat of a heavy video if i were just to explain what these are this is meant to be more of an advanced video right so if you don't even know what these are you might as well just leave the video here buddy you're in the wrong video no disrespect anyways back to what i was saying you have those four instances but if you think about it you only really need two well i guess it depends on how you have your framework set up and how advanced in coding you are if you have your framework set up with a module loader like the one i made in my last video bindables lose some of its functionality now because you can naturally communicate between systems that are running in the same place meaning in the client or in the server and i didn't even realize this until i actually made the module loader system so that's just another pro of using module loaders i guess but for this video we're only gonna focus on remotes meaning remote events and remote functions in a future video i'll go into why i think bindables are frauds too but for now we're just gonna focus on remotes what will we be doing with remotes we want to have an easily accessible way of triggering signals from the server to the client or client to server while also keeping everything as organized as possible after speaking with some of my friends you know what man shout out to my boy ideal man he heavily helped me figure out this stuff out this video literally wouldn't have been possible without your guidance man so thank you and also shout out to my boy brawler for reviewing this too and also shout out to nextrodomus man he's also helped me a lot y'all goats now what was i saying Oh, right, right. After speaking with these friends, I kind of realized that the way I was handling my remotes was, um, how do I put this? Trash. And that's why I remained my remote system, learned some stuff, and I'll be sharing what I learned right now. We're going to talk about how remotes work and how they're meant to be used. So remotes essentially send signals from client to server or vice versa. We already knew this, but this is where we enter the first thing that you might not know. And it's that depending on the size of the data you're sending as an argument, it might make your game unoptimized. Well, maybe not fully unoptimized, but at least not as optimized as it could be. So you have to understand the basics of data sizes and the only thing i'll tell you for now so your head doesn't explode is that the information is stored in bits which is short for binary digits oh, hell no! That's oh, hell no! don't worry i'll come back to this later i'm just gonna leave that there the reason why knowing this is important is because of arguments when dealing with remotes as i said depending on what you send as an argument will depend how fast the signal will reach the target the target being either the client or the server right knowing this Whenever you're about to use or create a remote, you have to take into account how much information you actually need. Can it be solved with a single number? Maybe a single string? Tables are probably the heaviest of the bunch, so try to avoid them as much as possible. Unless, and that's when we get to the next key thing you must know, if the remote is going to be used frequently, avoid sending large data. Sending large data is not as much of a problem if it's for stuff that it's not all that important or slightly borderline on noticeable delays won't be an issue. But some actions like input action processing is something that you want it to happen with little to no delays. Imagine in a combat game, a player presses the key to block, but there's a very slight but noticeable delay for the block or for the M1 or for the dashing. It just creates a very annoying experience, right? You get what I'm saying now? Now, if it's something like opening a door in a simulator game, then okay, do whatever you want. Actually, that's probably not the best example. I don't even think you need arguments for that, but you get what I'm trying to say, right? Next, do not just have one remote event and one remote function. Have multiple of them for different actions in your game. And I know what you might say. Yes, I'm not that dumb. Obviously, I'm not just gonna have those two for everything. Maybe you don't even know how that's possible, and you might be confused right now. I get it. But for those watching this video that are doing this, you'll know if you're one of them. Do not do this, okay? Why? Because of what I just said. If you just use one remote event and one remote function for everything, it's going to most likely force you to use.
use an identifier, which most likely is gonna be a string. If it's a number, it's not as bad, I guess, but still, even if you use numbers as identifiers, you'd have to deal with tables in arguments either way, since you're gonna have different types of data depending on the identifier. And an identifier is just an argument you send so that the target knows what piece of code to run, by the way. Hopefully, in, in part two, you're gonna understand this better. Just keep that in there for now. So as I was saying, depending on the identifier, it's gonna come with its own set of arguments that will most likely be put into a table. And what did we say about tables before? Avoid them. And not only so that the times we want to send the signal quickly, those signals can reach the destination as fast as possible. Okay, so what do we do then? Because so far we've established, one, send as little data as possible, and two, assign a specific remote to each game function. Now we have it a little bit harder than usual. How do we make sure that these two things are maintained and also make a highly organized and accessible system? Easy. We create our own signals module to work with our own module loader. Or you could get a free system someone else made and use that, but that's no fun. Plus, you'd have to learn how to use it too. Something that we also do is compress data size using Roblox's buffer API. Why? Because for the remotes, we can easily handle sending one argument that can be a number which is what you ideally want for remotes that are going to be used frequently. Number sizes in bits are set to 64 bits in Roblox Studio for convenience, I guess. And that's a lot more than you actually need. I'm going to show you how to use a single byte or 8 bits so that it cuts the speed at which the signal reaches the target. Imagine the signal you fire through the use of a remote as a package delivery guy. The identifier would be the package name label that's stuck to the box. The arguments or information you send on it would be what's inside the box. The more stuff you put into that box, the more time the delivery package guy is going to take to deliver that box because the speed at which he can move is affected by the weight of the package, no? Unless he Dwayne Johnson or something. So we're going to send only the essential stuff with the package delivery guy if he's going to be running back and forth between me and whatever the destination they put in. Remember this analogy so that when we're actually translating all of this into code, it's easier for you to understand. But all of that is going to be for the next video. All this sounds insanely hard to do, but it's really not. And it's insanely useful. So if you want want that next video just let me know by liking this video and leaving a comment but i'm telling you y'all are gonna like this one and a couple of more i got planned too here's a preview on what i'll be explaining and how it's set up the crazy part about this is that you don't even have to insert any remote events or remote functions anywhere directly this next system is gonna be interesting for sure but for now i gotta go so you already know keep leveling up bro be safe and i'll see you when i see you peace